introduction, which is thanking the organizers. Um, this is the second time that I have uh, the opportunity to uh, participate in, in, in an easy organized event and also be hosted by Groningen. That's very much <coughs> appreciated. Uh, my presentation was prepared before, beforehand on this topic and it has now been brought to this topic by the, by, by, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the recent presentations. And it concerns the place which a customary international law may or may not have in the regulation of the sources of international law. Uh, this presentation will proceed in three parts. And uh, turning to the first part, uh, I'd like to bring to the fore the fact that uh, Article 38 of the PCIJ and ICJ Institute uh, is not only being a focal point for uh, the, the, all the, most of the discourses on the sources of international law, but also, and it tends to be neglected and mostly in contemporary scholarship, uh, a, a, a focal point for practice. And this is the practice of how the PCIJ and ICJ Institutes, uh, Article 38, are used outside the context of PCI, PCIJ and ICJ proceedings by states. Uh, two positions have developed uh, around uh, the, the value of this practice and whether the patterns that uh, can be identified in that practice uh, amount to a form of regulation and whether that regulation may be considered a form of law. On one hand, you have the different views whereby um, it is recognized that Article 31 is, among others, a standard that is used by other international courts and tribunals as Crawford pointed out in 2006. Um, you also find uh, different ways in which uh, the, the, the rules that come out of these patterns of state practice are conceived of as being, for instance, uh, rules on lawmaking which are reflected in Article 38, as Tom Ushad, uh, mentions, but without stating what is being reflected. Is it custom? What is it? Uh, and then you have a similar view on the, pa on, on the part of Dolcer, who writes in the field of investment and is telling us that he will be taking to account the doctrine of the sources that is uh, reflected again in the PCAJ and ICJ statutes. But he's not telling us what is the legal value of that doctrine. So this is the reason that uh, in most contemporary scholarship, we have been uh, stuck with this view that uh, Article 38 and the, any rules on uh, any regulation of the sources of international law is a matter for theory, for doctrine, for philosophy, but not for law. Uh, and this is the point that perhaps Jörg has brought to the attention, the issue, the necessity of a, a law on law creation. And this brings me, on the other hand, to the view, which is um, in a way a, a minority view, but is common among most earlier commentators and has resurfaced in the work of at this one international court as it exemplified by this a statement that I found buried in a footnote in a decision of the appeals chamber of the ICTY in prosecutor versus Dordevich, whereby uh, it is said that Article 38 is regarded as customary international law. Now, turning to uh, the, the, the reason why there is a division between a recognition of a pattern in practice of uh, uses of Article uh, 38 outside the context of ICJ proceedings on one hand, and on the other hand, the proposition that that practice amounts to law and that that law is in a way reflected in Article 38 uh, of the ICJ Statute, I will say is mainly about conceptual assumptions because we know that all along the field has been divided over many controversies on the nature of the sources of international law. Turning to those conceptual assumptions, um, uh, I believe there are three aspects of a discussion of uh, the various theories on the sources of law and why they uh, may be placed on a spectrum in which they all end up denying the legality of any regulation of the sources of law. One aspect is that uh, most uh, uh, theories seek to provide an account of the rules on uh, uh, lawmaking which uh, accounts for both normativity and legality or not legality. So they will tend to deny the legality of those rules, but they will seek to account for the normativity of those rules. And I believe that um, 
uh, another distinction which I employ in my in my doctoral dissertation or, or I want to bring to the fore is the distinction between sources of law and sources of obligation. It can explain a lot of these interactions between normativity and legality in the field of lawmaking and how lawmaking uh, goes to the more concrete level of the actual ob international obligations, binding states and other subjects of international law. Another uh, aspect is the conception of custom. I believe that most of the views that uh, end up denying the legality of any rules on lawmaking are based on the fact that they look at custom and they critique custom, and they do rightly so, because a custom is being seen as a process. So these process-based conceptions of custom uh, prevent uh, a scholarship from actually trying to abstract uh, from the process the elements of custom as they are established in the, in the orthodox uh, theory of the two elements of custom. Uh, and this is the reason that perhaps one could turn to a conception of custom, of custom and other sources of international law as an outcome and see them as legal acts or facts which are used as instruments for law creation. And this instrumental conception of the sources of law is present in, in the writing of some commentators, including Capo Torti and Monaco. Um, I don't have the time to delve into this issue. And then I will turn to um, what we see. What is this spectrum of theories that deal with the patterns of use of Article 38 in a state practice, but uh, do not uh, establish what is the exact legal uh, quality of, of, of that pattern of practice. And it's the fact that you can identify rules, you can identify theories which accept the idea of rules on lawmaking. You can then identify theories which accept the idea of rules and on top of that claim that those rules have some legal value, some legality. And when they do so, thirdly, you may encounter theories that recognize the ruleness of these patterns the legality of those patterns and claim that it has a source. These are source-based theories. And then you will have theories which, on top of that, recognize or pinpoint uh, the source to uh, one of the recognized sources, and that tends to be custom. Why it tends to be custom? For many reasons. We know that custom is the most suitable source of law to create universal rules of international law, as Josh Pang Pangalangan uh, pointed out earlier. Um, and. Um, uh, this is what perhaps Marek called the inherent superiority of custom over treaty as a, as a source of, of law. Uh, turning to these theories, there is the one that I just discussed, the traditional orthodox praxis-based approach, which recognizes a pattern in practice but does not uh, see any legality in it. And it doesn't do that because it wants to avoid um, because it will posit externality. So it will be the tendency to say that any rules on uh, lawmaking or what uh, Jörg has called uh, the, the meta rules or the meta meta rules, if you like, those rules are not uh, part of the law. They are necessarily external to the law and there are different strands of this conception. And one of those is the avoidance of uh, a supposed infinite regress. And this idea of infinite regress appears in among others, the ninth edition of Oppenheim's uh, and their Jennings and Watts, whose quote I posted earlier um, ref referred to the work of Al Ross, but this is not Ross's idea. This also appeared in an article by Gerald Fitzmaurice, and it goes back all the way to Stroop in 1934. The idea that you need to establish a <coughs> chain whereby there is a rule that says that this is the source, but what is the rule that says that this is the rule on the source, etc., etc., ad infinitum. Um, now, turning to other theories, there is, uh, Hart, the, uh, the, the, there is Hart's conception of the rule of recognition, and we know that Hart was a, a skeptical of the legality of international law and did not see a rule of recognition in international law. But uh, those who want to uh, employ his uh, conceptual framework uh, consider that the fact that he did not see a rule, a, a rule of recognition in international law does not amount to a denial, a denial of its possibility, and then they go to try to establish a rule of recognition. <coughs> and you have uh, Neo-Hartian um, conceptions, of which uh, uh, John is, is, a, is a representative, uh, whereby we end up denying the existence of rules. And this denial of the ruleness of, of, of the sources of, 
of, of sources as a for as a formal law ascertainment method uh, is based among others on the fact that uh, in the end uh, there is a critique of the value of uh, asserting that there is a rule on the sources of law because what is the point of those rules those rules are not um, actually uh, <coughs> providing any guidance in terms of uh, uh, the law ascertainment. Uh, they don't provide tangi tangible and alternatives, and he is proposed the use of, of linguistical indicators, among, among others. And then there are Kelsenian um, uh, strands and neo Kelsenian strands of, the, of, of which Jorge is uh, representative, which see uh, rules, uh, which see sources as a rule as such, not as a legal fact or act that gives rise to the rule, but as a norm of empowerment. Uh, but while he, while these strands recognize the existence of rules and that those rules can be legal, that they are part of international law, they tend to rely on the group norm, which is ultimately presupposed. And therefore, <laughs> we fall again in the trap of externality, on basing the system on a rule which is outside the system. Uh, and uh, neo um, uh varieties of, of theories also posit the existence of a rule which is legal but one which is uh, based on a source, but what source? Some have posited consensus. So Ver uh, Verdros and Sima posited consensus, but consensus is not one of the recognized sources of law. So it, it, it risks uh, uh, running into uh, other difficulties that I will point out now, to which I will discuss now. So one interesting point of the traditional practice-based theory is that it links practice to normativity. But the problem with it is the denial of uh, legality, and I have explored why uh, the issue of infinite regress is a logical fallacy, and I will not dwell on that. Uh, turning to uh, Hartian uh, conceptions, um, I think there is work which has not been discussed in general jurisprudence. So, for instance, Lamont, who is um, a legal theorist, has discussed the possibility of uh, a rule of recognition being a rule as any other rule of law and being therefore source-based. And I like that uh, uh, approach and I believe it has merits. Uh, there is another issue with uh, the Harting conceptions and is that the rule of recognition is one that is based on the practice of officials. And as Lefkowitz has pointed out, the notion of official domain international law is a tricky one because uh, depending on the theory that you choose, you find theories that uh, ascribe officialdom to uh, entities or persons who are not subjects of the law there, and therefore lack the lawmaking powers to start with. Um, there are different aspects of the, of the Kelsenian and neo Kelsenian <coughs> uh, approaches. Um, I believe that uh, one difference uh, is that, uh, th that I want to point out is that one should not conceive of a source as a norm of empowerment. One should be able to separate the norm of empowerment and uh, the actual means of exercising that lawmaking power and the outcome of that lawmaking power. Those are all uh, notions that one should be able to distinguish. Otherwise, one would uh, be conflating the position of having the power to create rules with the actual means to do it. And that would co uh, basically conflate positions that, for example, Hoffel will separate uh, a, a, a theories in general jurisprudence. Um, now, when you uh, posit uh, a theory that uh, as accepts rules that they are legal, and that, but that they are not source-based, or are based on a source which is not one that is recognized, those theories, like Danilenko's, tend to run into issues of amendment. They cannot explain how the rules on lawmaking can be amended. Um, and I feel that one uh, problem of uh, the, both the Hartian, New Hartian, and Kelsenian and Neo-Kelsenian approaches is that they tend to um, uh, unduly ex um, generalize the uncertainties that are inherent in a process-based conception of custom to areas where uh, we can uh, be more uh, pragmatic and we can actually identify some consensus and, we're, and where we can identify some certainty. And this is perhaps what Tams has pointed out in his, in, 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 in his view that there are areas such as the two element theory where one could agree that there is a practice and that there is opinion juris and that therefore there may be a meta law on custom. Um, I was going to uh, look at the different uh, 
claims uh, that um, she uh, that posit the existence of a customary law on lawmaking. But I will leave those for perhaps uh, a Q and A issue. But before I leave, I want to raise another distinction, which is that, and, and which may be uh, contradictory for the field of international law, and is that both those who uh, support the idea of rules on lawmaking and that support the fact that the, the proposition that those rules may be customary tend to conceive of that custom as a custom in foro. A custom in foro versus a custom in pay, which is a distinction that Bentham proposed. Uh, a, a custom in foro is a, a notion of custom that comes from the practice of judicial authorities. That is a form of custom that makes sense in a, in a domestic legal system, but that would be more difficult to translate to, uh, the, to international law, given the fact that international adjudicate, adjudicators in international law exercise a mandate, but are not themselves subjects of the law uh, endowed with lawmaking powers. And on this note, I conclude. Thank you.